As a society, we, we have two tasks that we're supposed to do with our adult kids. We're supposed to be there when they need us. I mean, when your adult child suddenly has cancer or when your adult child has a baby or when your adult child gets a divorce, every parent will shift their lives to be there. It's what a parent does. But at the same time, the other task we're supposed to do as a parent is to ensure that our kids are independent. So we have two tasks that really oppose each other. And this becomes very complicated. We're supposed to make our kids independent, but we're all supposed to be there when they need us. And walking that line is very, very hard. And I think that's what makes parenting of adult children difficult. everyone, I'm Denise Gorant. Welcome to Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Thanks for joining us as we speak with experts, authors, parents, and even young adults to explore the transition from parenting our young children to building healthy relationships with our now adults. Hopefully we'll grow together, learn about ourselves, our young adults, and of course, when to bite our tongues. We are so happy you're with us. So let's get started. everyone. I'm so happy to report that I have Ellen joining me today all the way from Prague. You know, when she's with me, it takes a little bit of the pressure off. Welcome back, Ellen. We're so glad to have you. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Denise. And this is going to be such a good episode. I know it. I'm looking forward to it. What have you been up to? Are you done with your book yet? Almost. I've got three days left before I have to deliver it. And it's going to be done even if I take every night between now and then. No, it'll be done. And I'm excited about it. Oh, good. Well, I think today's episode is going to be great, and I think I really like getting different perspectives from different people. Even though we sometimes talk about similar things, I love the different perspectives. So many of our guests have said, don't let your ego get in the way. And then in the episode with Susan Engel, she said, what do you mean? Your ego is what helps you motivate your kids to read, to walk, you know, all of that sort of thing. But she did say, keep the ego in perspective. But today we're going to talk about real, real struggles, when for no fault of their own, parents are continuing to parent through adulthood. It's really catastrophic dependencies of their adult children. And it's usually, in my book, associated with mental illness, substance abuse, unemployment. It's a tough situation. And you introduced us to this book, and it's just being released now called Difficult, Mothering Challenging Adult Children Through Conflict and Change. It's written by Judith Smith. She's a leader in, now here's a word I never heard before, gerontological. How do you pronounce that? Gerontological? You think that's right? Gerontological? Yeah. It sounds right to me. It's (laughs) gerontological. Go ahead. This is why I'm a child psychologist and not a a gerontologist. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Gerontological. (laughs) Anyway, she's a leader in gerontological research focusing on women's experiences as they age. She's a senior clinical social worker, therapist, and professor at Fordham. She lives in New York. So her book really focuses on the perspective of the mother. And Ellen, since you introduced us to Judith, why don't you do a quick intro and tell us a bit more about the book? So her book is really one that focuses on the struggles of mothers who have difficult children, difficult adult children. And in writing the book, she didn't just send out this sort of cookie cutter questionnaire and ask for responses, but she spent hours talking to these women. And, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from women's stories, from everyone's stories, actually, but mother's stories, whether we have a difficult child or not, because hearing other people's stories is what helps us connect with our own stories. And they draw us in. I think we can recognize parts of ourselves in their stories. I think we sometimes know someone who is going through this experience. It's really a great way to be a support for someone else, even if even if it doesn't touch us. But I really think it will touch most people. And what's wonderful about it is she spoke to women who are over the age of 60 because she is a gerontologist and um it's and, gerontological not gerontologist well, gerontological researcher but right right okay gerontologist. gerontologist yeah you're right okay and, okay and and so that's why i 
I, I know how to pronounce one of them, but but the <laughs> other one is a little tougher. But anyway, she really talked to women from a variety of racial socioeconomic backgrounds. It's wonderful to hear about the variety, the breadth of motherhood experiences, because it touches us all. So hello, Judith. We're really happy to have you. And can you tell us a little bit more about why you wrote this book and why you think these experiences of older mothers are overlooked? Well, I'll start with the first question, why I wrote the book. I am older myself, and I spent the first part of my career as a psychotherapist and a researcher studying early children and their parents. And as I aged and my son got older, I became curious about what was known about mothering about older kids. And as an academic, I went to the literature to see what there was, and I discovered there was hardly anything. There's a huge gap in the professional literature, and as you all know, there's very few books written for parents about adult children. Most parenting books seem to assume that mothers' jobs end, I mean, if you look at how many parenting books, mostly it's about zero to three, um, but there's some about adolescence, and we're beginning to talk a lot about launching, but overall, people are not thinking about, actually, the relationship we have with our adult children is the longest time we have with our kids as adults. And obviously that's not a static time in any of our lives and that relationship changes. And I became really curious about what do people know about this and how can I contribute to that knowledge? That's such a great point. Yeah, and go ahead and answer the second part of that, which I'm also really curious about. Well, I think older women in general are assumed to be static people who are over, <laughs> finished, um, in the sense that we have an inner life and that we continue to grow, you know, I think is a revelation for most of us. Uh, we tend to discount older people. We're a very youth-centered culture. But I think another thing that definitely influenced me was as a social worker, I became familiar with the data about elder abuse and learned that what we call elder abuse, the most likely perpetrator is an adult child who is mentally ill and or has uh, substance abuse problems and is living at home. And when I heard that, I was really shocked. And I, you know, I think anybody's shocked to think that one's kid is, you know, verbally or physically assaulting their own mother. So I really wanted to begin to understand that. It made no sense to me as a child development expert. My whole career shifted to becoming a gerontologist. And I started this research project to understand from older women. I went to senior centers and I said, who's having any problems with their adult kids? And a few shy people did raise their hands. And I said, well, I want to talk to you. I didn't know what they were going to tell me. I wasn't, you know, were they going to tell me the problem is that, you know, they married the wrong person. Problem is they don't visit enough. I didn't know what what moms were going to tell me. And, um, you know, this developed into a many year research project. And then I realized I had a book. And so it's now a book. I find this really interesting. And it's funny, you, you decided to do this in much the same reason we decided to do it. We felt like it was completely overlooked. And Ellen and I were in these years of parenting our adult children. I hate to see parenting because it's really building a healthy relationship. But one of the things that really stood out to me in your book, and I imagine this happened when you say you went to these nursing centers, you were asking, okay, who um, has problems with their adult children? And you have this whole chapter on seeing and not seeing. And you say parents usually have stronger and more positive feelings about their children than adult children have about this parents, have about their parents. And it kind of overlaps with that seeing and not seeing, like how many parents, you said, you know, a few shy ones raised their hand, when in actuality, I'm going to guess the whole room could have had something to share with you, because we don't always see that there's a problem, or we don't want to admit it. I think that it's hard to see that there's a problem. I mean, your question has a lot of parts. Right. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I, I think the piece about, I mean, there's a lot of data that shows in all kinds of circumstances, parents will more positively uh, rate their interaction with their adult child than the adult child will rate with their parent. From a psychological point of view, one of the explanations is, is that in some ways, Adult kids and us as older parents 
are have different tasks in our lives. I mean, the adult child is their job is to separate. Right. And so the negative feelings often get exaggerated as a way to pull away. You know, it's hard to leave your mommy. And one way to separate is to focus on the negative. And as older parents, we're trialing to make sense of our lives and to see the value of what we've done. And so we want to see the positives and hope that our what we did with our kids was positive. Do you think this is different for our generation than it was for generations before us? Well, I think we have more leisure time. Clearly, when, you know, the, starting in the 60s and, so, you know, probably more 70s and 80s, people had more, there was more focus. It was after Freud, there was more emphasis on child rearing. I mean, Spock was the first person that really you know, most of, at least I was raised on Spock, that Dr. Spock made people realize that babies were real people and that it mattered how you treated them. And, you know, I think we're not that far away from the whole birth of psychological thinking and how it's all been internalized into how much we value parenting and how we see ourselves. But I think all families have always, you know, the family is the bedrock of any society. Mm -hmm. And certainly parents care what happens to their kids. And it's the main job that society gives parents is to raise kids. And, you know, how well we do, I would imagine, you know, affected our grandparents and great parents, great grandparents. But who knows? We only I know much more about myself and my parents and can't I never even knew my great great grandparents. So, you know, things obviously have changed and we're m nuclear families and things are different. So you talk about a good enough parent, and you have a chapter sort of about that. You use this Madonna example. Why do mothers measure themselves so much, the good enough mom? How do we take more control? How do we not let this affect us in the way that many mothers do? If you can come up with that, <laughs> I think you, you make a lot of money. You know, I think... It's so much in our culture. When I was doing the research for a book, I uh, read about evolutionary psychologists you know, who really look at, um, from a biological point of view, how different aspects of our way of being has had an evolutionary purpose. And actually, the idea, you know, I know, you know people often talk about how dads will throw their kids, you know, their toddlers up in the air. You don't see mothers throwing their toddlers up in the air as a cute little thing. We are much more protective, and evolutionary psychologists talk about the fact that women experience guilt and don't want to hurt their children really protected the species. You know, so guilt is not such a bad thing that you don't want to hurt and you care about uh, making sure that the priority is that the most vulnerable survive. I mean, that's what's kept human beings alive. So we have an evolutionary piece. And then we do have a society that is based on patriarchy and the assumption that women will be the nurturers. You know, I, my book is about mothering adult children. I partially, I started it because as a researcher, I was doing qualitative work. I couldn't, it would be too complicated to do dads and moms. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that parenting is gender uh, defined. And when we talk about parents, we're in some ways whitewashing who's doing most of the work. You know, I'm interested in mothering and I, you know, if I had another 10 years in me to do more studies, I'd talk to dads and I think a lot of things will overlap, but I think some of it will be different. Yeah. I, you know, I, as a psychologist, tell lots of parents that every good mother is a guilty mother. So you, you um, confirmed my belief that, you know, being a good mother means you feel you're feeling guilty about some of the things you've done because it means that you're analyzing what you've done. And I wonder what are the kinds of things you discovered in these interviews with other mothers about the sorts of things they felt guilty about, the sorts of situations that they regretted, or, you know, what are the things you learned from talking with them? Well, I guess I want to introduce the idea that I'm writing about a particular group of moms. And I guess, Denise, with you're saying that everybody in the room could have answered, mm -hmm. I think actually they all could have complained about something. Right. But the moms who actually chose to walk across the room and talk to me had serious problems with their kids. Right. Their kids were on drugs. Their kids were mentally ill. Their kids had such an anger problem they couldn't hold a job. 
So I'm my book is about mothers, what I've ended up, and I named them difficult adult children. Mm-hmm. When I first started this project, I would tell people I was researching difficult adult children. Everybody I met <laughs> said, oh, interview me, interview me. <laughs> <laughs> and but I knew, you know, their kids were going to Yale and they, they were doing fine. <laughs> they, they were not, you know, their mother might wish they visited more, but these were not the women that I was talking about. What I present in my book is about what it's like to be a mom. And most of these uh, women, their adult children, in order to be in my study, the kid had to have left. So I don't have, there's some mothers, you know, if you have a child who's born severely disabled at birth you know that you will be responsible till you die for this person. Mm -hmm. And psychologists call them perpetual parents. And it's not that they're helicopter parents. It's just you're going to have to be there because this kid can't become independent. That's not who I was talking to. Everybody in my study, their adult, their child had to leave at some point to go to college, to move out, to be with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But then things happened and they couldn't keep being self-sufficient. And I, and I get that. And I, I in our intro, we talk about that really this is about uh, parents for no fault of their own have unexpected catastrophic dependencies with their adult children. Can you share some of those stories and some of the results? I read the book and I found it really difficult to read because I was so empathetic. I mean, I loved it, mm-hmm. but I also really felt for a lot of these women right. what they were facing. I love how you do give some uh, suggestions on what they can do and that sort of thing. But maybe let's let the listeners hear a few of the ones that resonated with you or things that you think would be you know, of interest to the listeners. Okay. I'll talk about Jillian. So Jillian was 76 when I met her, and she described her situation as being like a mule being held by a harness, and the harness was her commitment to providing shelter and safety to her daughter, Celia, who had had her psychiatric break at 22. So I met her like 40, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. So the next 20 years in Jillian's life, she was married. She's a professional woman. Uh, She and her husband you know, were quite well off. And Celia, the girl, was living, went to college, living independently, and then got a call from a neighbor that the daughter was acting weird. So Jillian had to fly down there, took her home, took her to the doctor, and Celia had her first psychiatric break. And once she was um, settled after that hospitalization, and talking about Jillian, it's also a good example because I discovered that there are stages that women go through who have difficult adult children. I think it's true with all of our kids. But the first stage for Jillian was something's wrong here and I have to help. So Jillian had to drop everything and go and bring her daughter home, find a new apartment for her. And I think Jillian's situation with her husband was different than nearly, you know, than three quarters of the women in the book because they had sufficient financial resources to be able to house their daughter in a separate apartment. Whereas most people cannot afford to put their troubled adult child in a separate apartment. So the first stage was something's wrong. And then the next stage was Jillian went to find a new apartment for her daughter before she came out of the hospital. She fixed it up really nicely. I named it, this will be a new start. And the hope that, you know, we're going to begin again. Uh, She's near us, but not quite with us. But within six months, Celia had another uh, psychotic break, became paranoid, got evicted from the apartment. And basically, the next 20 years, Jillian moved her daughter 21 times. So even though the resources bought her some privacy with her husband, her guts were not, you know, the money can't buy you freedom in your heart and in your anxiety. And this went on and on and on. Um, And then 20 years later, something happened where what I called it crossing a line, where Celia, she had broken into the family apartment to steal things on several occasions. But this time she broke into their summer cabin, which had a lot of personal meaning to uh, Jillian. And she came into the, the neighbors called and said that the daughter had been there. She had flooded the place, destroyed, you know, many family, family heirlooms. Jillian described it as if somebody had put a knife in her heart. I mean, here's somebody who you've been taking care of for 21 years, and she's destroying, you know, it feels like she's destroying you. And she thought about calling the police, thought about cutting off all the money, 
uh, but she didn't. Um, but I, I named this time as crossing the line. And at this point, uh, Jillian and her husband decided they weren't going to continue to find new apartments. Um, they didn't cut her off financially, but they would pay for less fancy places, let her live in rooming houses. And then a few years later, the next stage, I think, in Jillian's life, I would call it was this is really Jillian's words that she felt like she was running out of gas. Uh, she was tired. She was getting old. She was worn out. Uh, she said, I just want to go into a hole and a cave and have nobody bother me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I finally want to detach. She said, of course, at age 76, that's when you naturally start detaching. But I think I realized that friends or people I know are dying and that I want to have quality time for the rest of my time that I have with my husband. That's my main responsibility. I mean, all this was having an impact on her health. She had bad irritable bowel syndrome. She had ulcers and she ran out of gas, um, but she couldn't give up. I mean, her daughter still needed her. And of course, her close friends, you know, would sometimes, you know, I'm sure some listeners, even though they may not have a difficult adult child, have a friend who has a difficult adult child. The interesting mm -hmm, thing about mm -hmm. this topic is we all know somebody in our social circle or in our families who's struggling with this. And often it's very easy to think, why is she doing this? Doesn't she know it's not going to work? But I think what I have tried to do is to really see and wonder what choice do mothers have? I mean, I know I've heard some people on your show say, well, you've just got to move on and let them live their own life. But if your child is this vulnerable to let them live their own life will mean allowing them to be homeless, allowing them to be arrested, allowing them to live on the streets with no mental care. These are very hard decisions. Um, and then the next stage that uh, Jillian is in now is planning for when she's gone. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, we all write wills. <laughs> But we assume that our kids can be self-sufficient. If you have an adult child who hasn't yet gotten it together and you've been the main lifeline for them, this is a terrible burden, you know, until someone dies about worrying about your kid. Yeah, yeah. Did, the, did Jillian have any siblings? I can't remember. Were there any siblings in the picture? You mean, did the... Did I'm not Jillian's Celia. Daughter. I'm sorry, Celia. Yeah, sorry. No. No, no. She had a cousin. You also had a chapter, and this comes right into that, on mixed feelings. What do I do? Right. And this stood out to me. You know, I want him out, or I want her out. But then the parent or the mother worries, will they get hurt? And with this uptick in suicide among young people, I think many mothers, and I'm going to add fathers in, are afraid to try that tough love or just let him go for the fear of the child committing suicide. Right. And I think that conflict of Rosita Parker is a psychologist who a number of years ago wrote a wonderful book called Torn in Two, in terms of talking about the conflicts of mothers of young children, that even mothers of young children have ambivalent feelings. We love our kids to death. We also wish that you know we could take a shower in peace and hate that they keep <laughs> yeah. wanting us. So I think Conflict and ambivalent feelings are built into all loving relationships and certainly into parenting. But it's also very much as a society, we, we have two tasks that we're supposed to do with our adult kids. We're supposed to be there when they need us. I mean, when your adult child suddenly has cancer or when your adult child has a baby or when your adult child gets a divorce, every parent will shift their lives to be there. It's what a parent does. But at the same time, the other task we're supposed to do as a parent is to ensure that our kids are independent. So we have two tasks that really oppose each other. Mm -hmm. And this becomes very complicated. And we're supposed to make our kids independent, but we're also supposed to be there when they need us. And walking that line is very, very hard. And I think that's what makes parenting of adult children difficult. I think when you have less difficult kids, you worry, well, how much money should I give? Or, you know, should I make the whole dinner vegan rather just because her boyfriend is vegan? Mm -hmm. You know, we worry about how much do we accommodate our kids. But when you have a much more vulnerable child, the conflict is really a daily conflict. You know, that if I am protecting my child as Jillian was, what about hurting myself? You know, that it's a daily conflict about whose needs come first. And I think before in one of the questions you asked, Denise, 
in terms of what mothers blame themselves for, certainly most of us have made mistakes and some mothers have made real mistakes. You know, they lived with an abusive man. They married a man who was abusive and they blamed themselves for that. They got divorced and they blamed themselves for that. They were poor and they had to put their kids in inadequate daycare and they blamed themselves for that. You know, at the moment, all of that self-blame isn't going to change the situation. And, um, you know, we have to forgive ourselves for what we did and understand that there's two people in this current situation. And when you have a child who has mental illness or who has a substance use issue, it's not all your fault, even if you made mistakes. I want to say, did you have any recommendations for Jillian? I know that that's not what the book is necessarily about. But from hearing this story, did you have any generalizations that you could say apply to other people? Well, the book does have three parts. The whole first part of the book is sort of naming the problem and talking about that there really is part of parenting certain children that is very, very difficult. I use the live stories of Jillian and many other women to talk about this. And then the second part and the third part of the book are about change. Right. And um, mm. I think what I present is that it's it's not easy to change any of this. I mean, there are not, there's there was no easy answer for Jillian. She had a lot of supports. She had a wonderful therapist. Her whole you know fifty years, forty years with her daughter. I don't think there was a magical answer of what she could do. Can I ask something? You, sure. you said in in the small steps um, chapter that there really is no evidence based models to transform this relationship with the adult child, but there are ways to evaluate your situation and learn how to instigate change. Mm -hmm. I would love you to talk about that and also the stages of change. And then the second part to that is you mentioned self assessment, why it's so important, and how does that help you make change? Okay, well, you know, first when I started this book and I was ta talking to people, they said, Judy, you can't just present the problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not going to sell a book that just presents a problem that has no answer. And at first I said, well, there is no answer. <laughs> but then I, you know, really pushed myself to think about this. As a therapist, I'm familiar with, I'm going to blank on their names, the two psychologists, Petrasky and... That's okay. We can, you can tell it to me later and we'll put it in the episode notes. For people who have an addiction problem, they created a model called the stages of change, which basically assumes that this is not an easy, it's not easy to give up drinking. It's not easy to get clean of heroin and then go back to your life, that people slide back. And to create a model that says it's an all, you know, it's all or nothing and that you're bad if you can't go all the way through is not going to work. And that you really have to begin with each client or here each mom has to really assess where she is. In order to decide that you're going to make some changes, you have to really be uncomfortable. And that's what these psychologists, they have a decisional balance sheet, which I also include in the book, right? to have you assess. You know, some people are okay. They don't mind that their kid is there all the time. And, you know, they like the company and, you know, they can live with it. Other people are more uncomfortable. That discomfort has to be the motivator. The same as giving up drinking, going on a diet. There has to be a reason why you're going to give up the chocolate cake. The same with, you know, what makes it hard changing your relationship with your adult child is, one, the fear that you're going to lose them forever. Mm. And I think my model of change is one that doesn't assume that mothers can walk away from their kids. There are people who do. And sometimes to protect yourself, moms have had to get uh, orders of protection and had to have their kids removed in order to save their life and save their adult child's life. If, you know, if, if the adult child really hurt them, then that kid is at risk as well. But the assessments that I include in the book are a depression screening. Because if you yourself are depressed, making a change is impossible. So often, especially as we get older, many people assume, well, of course you're depressed, you're old. And of course you're depressed. Do you have a, you know, a son who's an addict? But that's really not true. Depression is treatable. And what I encourage people who are reading the book 
is to take that assessment and bring it to your physician and talk about how depressed you are. And there is medication to help with depression. Mm -hmm. And if you can be less depressed, you will feel more hopeful and can begin to think about things that you might like to change in the situation with your adult child or to increase ways in which you have bring in pleasure for yourself. So the book, the third part is about things women can do for themselves. I mean, you can't change your child's mental illness. You can't stop your child from taking drugs. And this book is not about how to change your child. This book is about how to be in tune with your own experience mm -hmm. and to begin to take care of yourself, perhaps, in a different way. I talk a lot about social support. There's a lot of studies that show, especially in this pandemic and the quarantine, you know, we, and I certainly deal with my mental health by going for a walk mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. But for people who are depressed, they've shown you go for a walk with a neighbor or a friend that will affect your depression much better than just going for a walk. So sort of social support really matters. And that for moms who have kids who have serious problems, connecting with people outside of your family can really make a difference. So joining a National Alliance of Mental Illness has support groups for family members. Al-Anon offers groups for parents of addicts. And so beginning to talk with other people, because I think the other part of this difficult situation is mothers blame themselves and they don't tell anybody about it. And you say they don't ask for help. And they don't ask for help. Right. Yeah. Because how can you ask for help if you're blaming yourself and That's you're exactly ashamed? right. I think shame takes yeah. a lot of play in all of this. Yeah. Right. I want to go back to what you said when I, because I actually love this chapter, the seeing and not seeing. And you talked about these two things playing against each other where the child wants to separate. So they're seeing the negative in the parent and the parent wants to feel like they did a good job. So they're seeing the, seeing the positive in the child and the mother is typically to blame. Do you think this is terrible because both of you are therapists. Um, it's always been the whole thing. You go to a therapist and they say, tell me about your mother. I just finished watching the the Netflix or I don't know whether it was Apple TV, The Shrink Next Door. Have either of you watched that? Not yet. No. I listened to the podcast. Yeah, I listened to the podcast too. It's very good. But this shrink, and I know this is an extraordinary situation, literally cuts this person off from his entire family, basically saying it's all the family that's bad for them. Do you think that plays a little bit in the blame and the mother and the kids today that are divorcing their families and you also bring up in your book, not appreciating your parents. Adult children tend not to appreciate their parents. Does your therapist or therapy or anything play a role in this? I know it's a crazy question, but I had to bring it up. Well, I think the field has been criticized by some feminist psychologists as, you know, blaming mothers too much. You know, I am somebody, I'm a psychodynamic psychotherapist. I very much believe, and there's all this data about that the first three years of life in terms of having a safe, warm, and loving connection with one stable person makes all the difference in a person's future. I mean, there's zillions of data over the last uh, 15 years that says that. But that's a mother and a father and society. You know, we so much put this on the mother, but you know, men are walking out of families and it's the mothers who are staying. Then I think 80% of all children at some point are being raised in a single parent family. I mean, it's very hard to stay married. And it's the person who's carrying most of the weight of raising the kids is women. That's changing. There's a maybe 2% of single parent families are men now and that, you know, rising. But I think, Denise, to answer your question, there is some part of our culture that blames mothers. I don't know if you read in the part of the book, Ellen or Denise, about the story of some mom being in Costco, and she's on the line, and uh, this is done by a reporter, and she's waiting for the customer service, and this guy and her kids are, you know, screaming. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember it. Go ahead. And the, and the father says, you know, not the father, I mean, the man behind her starts criticizing her for not, for allowing her children to cry. And this woman writes a long note about, you know, how easy it is for people to criticize us. I, and there's this wonderful woman, Alot Waldman, who wrote a book called The Bad Mother. 
I do it myself. We're on the subway. We get angry at people for not being more attentive to their kids. And it's very easy to think that one could be perfect and be attuned to one's child and everything would be okay. Yeah. And it's much harder to accept that relationships and people are hard. Yeah. But I do think mothers do get blamed and we blame ourselves. And um, it's all very complicated and hard. And women have internalized a lot of this in terms of, you know, feeling like we should be able to have made it all okay. I also think, Denise, since you brought this up, and I'll just add from my own experience, which is that when you're talking about vulnerable populations, a bad therapist, and there are bad, you know, there are bad in every profession. There are great people, there are good people, and then there are a few ones that aren't. And when we're talking about vulnerable adults who are alone and don't have other people to say, gee, I don't think what your therapist said was the the best thing she could have said to you. It's very easy for a mediocre or, or not great therapist to make a mistake with these the, these sorts of adult children who might have significant mental health issues, who might not have a support system to say, you know, maybe misinterpreted what the therapist said. So it's it's pretty easy. Sometimes therapists could say, you know, I think you're acting like this because your mother wasn't there at a critical time in your development. And that could take a different meaning for someone who's really alone and vulnerable. And it could make them blame in a lot a, a more significant way because it's not being used as a way to sort of look at their life but instead, they're only capable at that point of blaming their parents. So it's a complicated issue. It is. Mm-hmm. And the situations right. Judith talks about are even more complicated. I mean, we could talk about the generalizations of this for a long time. But when you get into mental health and addiction and the kind of complex personality disorders and that sort of thing, it becomes really difficult. So I guess I just want to say I would encourage everyone to look at the book, to read the book. The stories are both devastating and heartwarming in some ways, and it helps all of us to be better people in our life. Judith, we end every episode with asking our guest to give us one or two things that you really want our listeners to take from this episode. Could you provide us with a couple of those? Sure. First, I want everybody to know the name of the book. Oh, which is... we do say that in the <laughs> intro, but go ahead. Okay which is difficult, um, mothering challenging adult children through conflict and change. And I think the first takeaway is that being the mother of an adult child who has serious mental health challenges or substance use disorder is difficult. And I hope that listeners today and readers will start using this term. I believe if, you know, my grandiose vision is that this will be equivalent to how we started naming domestic violence. Mm. We didn't have that name 30 years ago. And when your husband hit you, there was no way to say, oh, this is a problem that other women have as well. It's not just that Joe is this horrible guy. This is domestic violence. And I think having a name can change everything. So I hope that people will start thinking about using the names. I think it's much easier for parents to say, if you say, I have a difficult adult child, rather than my son is an addict. If you say, my son is an addict, there's really nothing you can do about that. But if you say, I have a difficult adult child, if something's difficult, maybe there's ways to think about it and get advice and find resources to make it less difficult. And I also think it's much less pejorative than saying, my son's an addict. It's describing how hard it is for you to be the mom of this Mm. adult child. And then I think the second thing that I hope people will take away is that just a good example of um, acknowledging that something's difficult can lead to change. One of the women I interviewed, Leslie, she got involved, a very ill son uh, who she realized would not recover. She got involved with NAMI, and she became an advocate. She is now a full-time advocate for improving mental health in Iowa. She has taken the difficult situation in her life, the parts she couldn't change, but she's now has a sense of agency about what she can change. And I hope the other takeaway that people will have from this book 
is that they are not alone. I mean, we didn't go over the statistics, but there's, you know, over 8 million older adults who are caring for an adult children with mental illness. 8 million. Wow. Yeah. Every person who has a substance use disorder has a parent. Yeah. I mean, this, this is not a question on the census form right now. Do you have a difficult adult child? You know, we look at who's living in the house, but we don't know what their issues are and what their problems are. And I hope that people who read the book, I hope policymakers will get to this because we haven't talked about the societal problems that are contributing to this. We have a broken mental health system. Very true. We do not have enough psychiatric beds. We do not have sufficient substance abuse care that's affordable and accessible. The homeless problem is connected to the mental health problem. Finally, I guess the last takeaway is I hope people will stay in touch with me. I hope you'll read the book. You can write to me at Judith R. Smith at difficultmothering.com. And I have a website, which is Difficult Mothering. And I hope, you know, the next step in my doing this book is to hopefully make some changes. And one change is to help people feel less alone and to begin to find ways to talk to other parents to both have a sense of solidarity and hopefully to be able to learn from each other. I think the one intervention that I came across is being done by social workers at a group called JASA, which is a social work agency group in New York. They run groups for older people who have abusive adult children. But I certainly hope that um, this will make people feel less alone and make them feel that there is some hope and that it's not your fault that you have a difficult adult child. There are ways to begin to begin to take better care of yourself and to be less isolated. That Those are terrific takeaways. And yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us quickly, I know the book is just coming out. When will it be available on Amazon? Because I'd like also to uh, put a link into that in our episode notes and also our social media. Well, it's on Amazon now. It is. Okay. The actual launch date is February 2nd. Okay. But you can order it from Amazon, from Barnes and Nobles, from your, it's available in every online platform. That's terrific. Well, Judith, thank you so much for joining us. Your book is wonderful. And I think we're all going to start using, I have a difficult adult child. Um, I think that's a good term. And I think it brings support from others around you too. So that's a great idea. Okay. Thank you both for doing this show. I mean, there's so little around to really address the issues of adult children. And I, I'm glad we found each other. Me too. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Judith, for a wonderful interview. It was also so good to have Ellen back. As Judith mentioned at the end of this interview, there is so little researched or even talked about in the area of parenting and adult children. We're hoping this podcast does a little bit to fill that niche, but we can't do it without your help. Please send us the topics you'd like us to discuss or questions you might have. We'll get right on it. Just send an email to biteyourtonguepodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, listeners, follow us on social media and share your favorite episodes with friends. Thanks again so much for listening. We hope you're having as much fun as we are. And thanks again to our audio engineer, Connie Fisher. And finally, remember, there are certain times you may just have to bite your tongue.